Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're so glad you're here. The Lord's going to speak to us through his word today. And um, immediately after the service, you're all invited to stay for a fellowship meal. We'll set up tables in here. We'll go through and get food. We have plenty of food for everybody, so be sure to stay for that. And then at 1 o'clock, um, we will have a meeting, uh, just a quick meeting about where we're feeling as a leadership team uh, led regarding possible building project, and we're going to have a time for you guys to answer questions. I don't see that meeting being super long, um, but we want to keep you up to date about some of the things we're thinking about and praying about, and also to have you pray with us, and then also um, ask questions and help maybe even sharpen our thinking a bit. So that's going to be immediately after. Hope you can stay for that. Uh, if you're listening on the radio, get here by one. We'd love it if you can come to our building meeting. That would be great. It won't be on the radio, however. So um, let's dig right in here. So he was 70 plus years old. He's in his 70s when he first met God. Oh, he'd worshipped other gods his whole life. He believed in many gods, but then suddenly the living God of the universe, Yahweh, showed up to him and revealed himself and said, trust me, follow me. In fact, he asked the old man to do something hard. Those of you in your 70s, sorry, I called him an old man. He asked him to do something hard, and that was to completely surrender to the Lord's will. Pack up your belongings, pack up your family, and Go. Where? I'll show you. He didn't even know exactly where the Lord was going to lead him. But he showed him his beauty, and the old man saw the beauty of the Lord, and he believed, no, there's only one God, and that's how the Lord revealed him. There's not other gods. There's not many. There's only one God over all creation. Follow me. The old man's name was Abraham. What's he going to do? Now, why did God come to Abraham? Did God come to Abraham because Abraham was the most righteous, godly person on the whole earth? No! Abraham had worshipped other gods his whole life. What did Abraham bring to the table? Nothing. But that's God's very heart, is grace. Grace, you bring nothing to the table. You offer nothing for your salvation. God brings everything and he invites you into relationship invites you into relationship. What does Abraham do? He has a choice. Is God really who he says he is? Is he powerful? Is he trustworthy? And he believes God, packs everything up, heads out to Lord knows where, literally, Lord knows where. But then he's under new ownership. Abraham's recognizing that his life is not his own anymore. He lives for a higher purpose than just, well, he was a rich man and he Continued to be rich, but he wasn't living for riches anymore. God said to him, no, through you, I want to bless all peoples on earth. That's a bigger purpose than just your own selfish comfort, Abraham. I want to bless all peoples on earth through you. I want you to notice a pattern here in Abraham's story, okay? I want you to notice a pattern. It's in your bulletin. So here's the pattern to Abraham's story. God reveals himself, and he invites to trust and follow. God reveals himself. For the first time in his life, Abraham sees the true and the living God, Yahweh, sees his beauty, sees his glory, sees his power, falls face down in the sand, which is the appropriate response when God shows himself. God reveals himself and invites. Now then there's a choice, okay? There's a choice. And for Abraham, Abraham believed. Abraham surrendered. Because when you follow God, he's not simply calling you to, to like mentally approve to a series of ideas. He's wanting the reality of God to affect your, not just your head, but your hands and your tongue and your feet and your bank accounts and everything. Surrender. Either God is God over all creation or only part of creation. The Bible's pretty clear. When you see him face to face, you also experience it. Or when you He's God over everything, and the only proper response is, well, in fact, belief and surrender are really synonyms in the Bible. They're synonyms. The Bible doesn't use the word surrender, but simply believing intellectually is not enough. In fact, it says in James that the demons intellectually believe in God. 
but they don't really love his lordship. They don't think he's beautiful. So the third thing though, is after you believe, after Abraham believes and after Abraham surrenders, he recognizes that he has a new owner. He has a new purpose. His life is no longer just his own. And he says it specifically to Abraham, I want to bless all the nations on the earth through you and through your descendants, which is why we have this picture of the stars later on in the story. God shows up to Abraham multiple times to strengthen his faith. And just out of pure grace, because Abraham keeps blowing it, and he says, I'm going to give you more descendants than the stars of the sky. And at this point, Abraham's uh, in his 70s, and his wife is probably in her late 60s, and she's never been able to have kids. It's going to take a miracle of God. But he has a new purpose, a new owner. I want to take you to another story of Scripture. I want to take you by the ocean, the Red Sea. And there's not just one person now, though. There, there's, there's millions of people by the ocean, trapped. Now, here's what happened. God showed up to them. See, he revealed himself, remember? God revealed himself to the people of Israel in a literal pillar of fire, a literal pillar of uh, cloud by day, and he leads them. And so, I mean, they show, God's showing himself, and they follow him to an ocean, and then suddenly... God allows the biggest army on earth to surround them. And this people has no weapons. They're stuck. Either they swim, which they can't swim that far. They'd all die. Or they die. I mean, God led them to this hopeless situation. But he had revealed himself to them over and over and over again. Are they going to trust God? Now notice the pattern. Again, God reveals himself. He invites to trust and follow. He first revealed himself to Moses early in the story through a burning bush. Is Moses going to believe? Is he going to believe that God is as beautiful and powerful as he says? And Moses follows. And then God reveals himself through 10 miracles in Egypt. And all the people see these 10 miracles are 10 plagues against the Egyptians and against their gods, showing their gods to be weak and him to be the only true God. Will they follow? Now, what did the Israelites bring to the picture? Did God pick out the Israelites because they were the smartest, best-looking, least sinful people on earth? No. No. In fact, when God leads them to the Red Sea, the first thing they do is what any smart, intelligent person would do. They complain against the living God. I'm kidding. That's sarcasm. That's a terrible thing to do. But it is human nature, is it not? God, if you loved me, why did you give me this? Right? That's all they bring to God is their sin and their unbelief and their complaining. And God, in spite of their sin and unbelief, he speaks through Moses. Moses says these great words. He says, God's going to fight for you. All you've got to do is be still, be quiet. Literally what it says in Exodus chapter 14. And despite their unbelief, God opens up the way through the Red Sea and after that, they start to believe. They believe and they surrender. Now, why is God defeating? Is he just trying to make Egypt look bad? Is he just wanting to give Israel a comfortable life? He says, I'm going to take you into the promised land. Why is God leading his people into the promised land? Important question. Does he just wanting to give them a piece of dirt with some nice plants and a comfortable life? No. He wants to give them the promised land so that they would live for his glory and show God's glory, his beauty, his power to the nations. It's not just a comfortable, you know, milk and honey filled life. So he's going to give them the promised land. He's going to fight for them, but it's a new purpose. See, the people have a new owner. God is their owner. He is their king. And they have a new purpose, not just living for myself and my comfortable promised land, my plans, my priorities, my agenda. But God gives them the promised land not as an end in and of itself, but to show the nations that he's great and he's powerful and he's beautiful. Okay, so now we're going to take you to the story we're at today in Scripture. We're not going to turn there just yet, but it's a dark room. It's called the upper room, apparently upstairs somewhere. It's a dark room, and Jesus and 11, one of them has left already, Jesus and 11 of his disciples are sitting around a table. Actually, they're laying around a table. So how they did it back in the Greco-Roman Empire. They're laying around uh, a table. And I want you to notice the pattern again. God reveals himself 
and invites to trust and follow. That's what Jesus has been doing for three years with these men. In fact, he said it multiple times, follow me. And who has he been revealing? The Father, God the Father. Jesus is fully God in himself, second person of the Trinity, and yet God the Father is is invisible. And so it says later on in Colossians that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's revealing what God is like. Do you know what God is like? He loves needy people. He loves hurting people. He loves broken people who bring nothing to the picture except for their sin and their brokenness. You know what God doesn't like? Proud people who follow their own agenda. Now, he invites them too, but they've got to lay down their own agenda. That's what God is like, and Jesus has been revealing him as that for three years, and he's inviting them to trust and to follow. What will they do? Well, they believe. They surrender. So these 11 of the 12 disciples believed. Judas didn't like Jesus' agenda. He didn't. He didn't really like how Jesus was trying to carry out his kingdom. He thought he was smarter I mean, that's a little simplistic, but it's true. These other men had learned, no, Jesus' agenda is better. They have to learn it about a thousand times because they're a lot like me. I guess Jesus' agenda is better, and every time it is, they believe, they surrender, and they now have a new owner. Jesus claims to be Lord, Master. They have a new owner and a new purpose. We're going to go into what that purpose is a little bit later on today. So an important question, is this just the way that God moved, you know, back when things, cool things used to happen, you know, when God used to actually move in the earth, he doesn't anymore, that's sarcasm for those of you who aren't familiar with me, okay? Is this just the way that God used to move in history, or is this still the pattern of how God moves today, that he shows people his his forgiveness, or his glory, or his power, or his beauty, and then they have a choice, Either he is who he says he is, and I can trust him with my life, or maybe I'm smarter than him, and I'll just go my own way. But if you follow him, he gives you a new owner, a new purpose. This is still the same way that God works today in 2021. He wants to reveal himself to you today. All of us are struggling. All of us have hard things and pain, and we need to be reminded that he's beautiful, and he's glorious, and he's powerful, and he's worth following. So let's dig into John chapter 17. John chapter 17, if you uh, did not bring a Bible, we'd love for you to read along. We have black Bibles, every couple chairs in front of you. It's page 903 in those black Bibles, page 903. We'd love for you to read along to see that I'm not making this up. If you have your own Bible, turn to John 17 and and, and verse 6. If you don't own a Bible, take that church, that Bible's our church's gift to you. And if you know someone who needs a Bible, take it and give it to them. So here's where we're at. We've been going through this last speech of Jesus for a couple months, actually like five or six months, where Jesus is, it's the night before he dies, and he's preparing his followers for the fact that he's about to go away. He's preparing his followers for their their purpose to continue to follow his purpose after he goes. And then last week, uh, at the beginning of John chapter 17, he starts to pray this amazing prayer. And he prays about the Father, and he prays about sharing glory with the Father in verses 1 through 5. And now his prayer turns to the disciples. And by the way, in a few weeks, we're going to read the end of John 17 where he prays for you. Ooh, you can read the ending before that if you want, okay? You'll become prepared. But it's so amazing to think about Jesus knowing down the road, and he's praying for you. It comes later on John 17. But right now, he's praying for the disciples. Now, notice as he prays for the disciples, the first thing is the pattern reveals. God reveals himself and invites them to trust and follow. Because Jesus is he's kind of going over the history here, a little bit of the disciples' walk. Verse 6. Jesus is praying here, and Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were. You gave them to me. They have kept your word. Let's start at that first part. I have manifested your name. Some of your versions translated that word revealed. It's the same thing. To manifest is to take something hidden and show it. And Jesus is saying that he has been taking the name of the Father, the beauty of the Father, the glory of the Father, which is hidden to so many people, and he's pulling back the curtain. He's revealing it. To manifest is to make visible, to reveal. 
And now notice what he says, what he says that he is revealing. He says he's revealing the name of the Father. Now, this is weird language. We don't use this language in uh, modern English very often. Someone's name, now we might associate someone's name with their reputation a little bit, but that's not how it worked in, in to actually even in today in other cultures, it's not how it works. And it's not that way in the Old Testament and the New Testament culture. The name was not just like, oh, it's Joe. It said something about Joe. Their name did, the Holy Father. And Jesus wants to reveal to us something about the Father, who he is, his name. Name is the glory of who someone is, specifically in this case, the glory of who God is. Jesus wants to reveal God's glory, his power, his majesty, his beauty. Later on in this prayer today, we're going to cover, he prays, God, keep them in your name. Keep them experiencing the glory of who you are. Keep them experiencing your, your, that you're alive. And Jesus here, he's revealing God's name. He's revealing who God is. See, that's the first step, right? God reveals himself, and then there's a response. He invites him to trust and follow. Do they trust and follow? Well, let's keep going here. So notice the second step, the people believe and surrender. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. They have, now notice this language, they have kept your word. It's a response, a faith response. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me. What did they do with the words that Jesus gave them? They have received them. And they've come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have, notice this word again, they have believed that you sent me. When they saw Jesus in his glory and his beauty and his power, they responded, how can you not? How can you not? When we really see Jesus, even a small glimpse of how amazing he is, it just stirs up faith and response in us. And they have responded. He says, they have kept your word. They have believed that you sent me. So God shows himself, and the disciples have responded, and then they have a new owner. They have a new owner. Look at verse 6. Notice the ownership language here. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. In other words, the Father owned the disciples, and he gave them to the Son as a gift whom you gave me out of the world, yours they were. Who do they belong to? The Father. You gave them to me. They have kept your word. Skip down to verse 9. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you, whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. This is this beautiful ownership of being owned by God, being owned by Jesus. By the way, three persons in one God, he just mixes it all up around here. They're mine, Jesus says, and they're also yours, the Father, because God is three and one at the same time. The people have a new owner. Now, let's back up, okay? Verse 9, verse 9, I am praying for them, the disciples. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. So he's contrasting the disciples with the world here, all right? Now, as you go through the Gospel of John, John uses the word world in a very specific uh, way. He, he isn't talking about like planet Earth, just the general globe. He's talking about people on the globe and a specific group of people. As we look at the world throughout the Gospel of John, the world is those who live for themselves, in other words, they're not Christians, you could say. The world is those who live for themselves. They do not see Jesus' beauty. Jesus, meh, right? Meh, it's okay. Jesus is all right, meh. They don't see Jesus' beauty. But because they don't see his beauty, they don't submit to his ownership. Ownership? I don't believe in that kind of God. You might believe in that kind of God, but not my God. Nope. That's the world. All of us are born into the world. All of us are born into the world, but God wants to take us out of the world. He wants to show us his glory and his beauty, and if we believe in him, he takes us out of the world and he puts us into a new people, okay? It's not just individualism. We follow God. Man. He's putting us, you're either in the world or you're in a new people, all right? Takes us out of the world, and, and we're put into a new group of people where we're growing in our ability and our desire to submit to God's ownership because the world doesn't want to. Here's an important question. 
What is God's attitude towards the world, those who don't believe in him? Well, John 3.16 says, it says God loves the world. Ungrateful wretches that I am and they are, they did nothing to earn his love. Some of them remain and some of them never trust in Jesus. So notice, the, notice even John 3.16, a well-known verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, what the world is perishing. He takes them out, puts them in a new people, a safe place, a, the place of his son and his son's people. They see Jesus' beauty. They believe in Jesus. So that's his attitude towards the world, but many Many in the world will never believe in Jesus. They don't find him beautiful. They don't find him powerful. He's not worth living for. They don't want to submit to his ownership. But the disciples are different. No, no. The disciples joyfully submit to God's ownership. And Jesus mentions here three times, three times that the disciples are under God the Father's and his ownership. Three times. Verse 6, 9, and 10. Actually, he says it more than that. If you want to, he says it in backwards ways. He probably says it five or six times in these verses, if you really get accurate. But he says explicitly, they are mine, or they are yours, three times. Three times the disciples are under God the Father's and his ownership. Well, Tice, that's the varsity. Remember them disciples, they're the varsity. But today, he doesn't move that way anymore. He doesn't put us under his ownership when we trust him. That's not really his goal. Well, the Apostle Paul later on says something that's meant to be true of all Christians. It's in 1 Corinthians 6. I'm going to put it on the screen. Here's what Jesus uh, wants to be true of all Christians. In fact, he says it to Christians through the Apostle Paul. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Huh. Huh. See, we kind of believe, we kind of wish and hope that there's like a junior varsity, right? Junior varsity Christians. Well, I'm never going to make the varsity because I'm not strong enough. Well, the, actually, the only reason people are, I mean, no one's strong enough. I'm just kind of on the junior varsity where I tip my cap to God every once in a while. Yeah, that's all God wants from me, to obey the big rules like not murdering or stealing. And then tip my cap to him every once in a while. But Jesus has better for you. No, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. What was that price? It was the blood of his son, paying for your sins, paying for your forgiveness, and purchasing you, if you're trusting in him, purchasing you. You're under a new owner. You've got a new purpose. Uh, I'm going to admit, this is hard. Let's dig in, everybody. Americans, including American Christians, are terrified terrified of the idea of God owning them. Terrified. I wake up in the morning, I don't really want God to own everything I have and everything I do and every single moment of my day. I don't think that's a good idea. I somewhere deep inside my heart think I'm smarter than him and all that he wants is an occasional hat tip. But he, he owns everything. He doesn't say, love the Lord your God with some of your heart. Oh, and some of your soul. And a one hour on Sunday mornings. Hmm? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, everything. But we're terrified of it. And as Americans, this is kind of baked into us from an early age, right? That I'm my own man. You don't tell me what to do. Okay, I'm going to spit it out there. Listen to me closely. Listen to me closely. Democrats don't like doing what other people tell them to do unless they agree with it. Republicans don't like doing what other people tell them to do unless they agree. Did you hear me? Huh. Apparently rebellion is baked deep within our hearts. And then God tells us what to do? Nope. No. Now that's not the kind of God that I serve. I don't serve a type of God who'd tell me what to do. <laughs> he just wants me to be a moral person every once in a while and tip my cap to him. Mm-mm. You are bought, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. And the reason we're terrified of his ownership is we don't think he's all that powerful. We don't think he's all that beautiful. We don't think his plan is all that beautiful. We don't think he's all that majestic. Hmm. No, he's beautiful. He's majestic. He's powerful. 
and he wants us to experience it. Jesus thinks that living your life under God's ownership leads to freedom. And that's countercultural because in American freedom, we, we, you know, that means no one tells me what to do except for certain things I agree with, right? God's idea of freedom is becoming who he created you to be. Just let that sink in for a minute. American freedom is no one tells you what to do. God's freedom is becoming who he created you to be. Hmm? And that leads to freedom. And it leads to peace. And it leads to joy. Are you smarter than Jesus? Some of you are going to walk away today and you're going to say, yes, I am smarter than Jesus. I'm smarter than him as to what is freedom. I'm smarter than Jesus as to what leads to peace. I'm smarter than Jesus as to what leads to true joy in life. All of us do. And it's called sin. It's ugly. It's terrible. And we need our hearts changed from it. I'm just going to go through uh, some of those verses on the bottom, okay? Don't turn to them. I'm going to just kind of paraphrase them for you. In John chapter 7, Jesus uh, gets up and he says, whoever believes in me, whoever thirsts, let him come to me. And whoever believes in me out of his heart will flow, well, little tiny trickles of water. When you're under my ownership, I only give you little bits. He says rivers and rivers and rivers of living water when you're under God's ownership. That's what he says, okay? Later on, he says in John chapter 8 and verse 31, he says, you will know the truth and the truth will, coming under my ownership, because he says, I am the truth later. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I mean, it's a pretty amazing and ridiculous claim if Jesus isn't who he says he is. John 10 and verse 10. Jesus says, um, I will give to you just a little bit of life, just a little. He says, abundant. It could be translated overflowing, full to bursting, life. Falling under Jesus' surrendering to Jesus' ownership leads to abundant, overflowing life. That's what he says. You don't have to agree with him, but it's what he says. John 14, 27. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He says, coming under my ownership, it leads to greater and greater and greater peace. He says in John 15, it leads to greater and greater security in God's love when we're under his ownership. It says in John 15, 11, he says, I've said these things to you that you'd have my joy in you. Coming under God's ownership leads to joy. Oh, do you see how ugly it is when we say to God, no, your joy is not that great. That's because we don't, we don't have any clue as to his majesty and his beauty. Oh, in my heart, I deeply am rebellious. I think my path will lead to more joy and peace than his so I have to see his beauty over and over and over again, and he wants to give me that. He wants to show me that regularly over and over and over again. So let's go through it here. God reveals himself, and he invites us to trust. He invites us to follow, and then we have a choice. The people believe and surrender, and then the next thing is that the people have a new owner, and as we notice here, a new purpose. So let's look at John 17 and verse 11, the new purpose. And I, Jesus says, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Jesus says, I'm about to go to the Father, and yet the disciples are going to remain in the world. That gives us some hint as to their purpose. Skip down to verse 18, where he explicitly spits out the purpose. Verse 18, Jesus says, as you sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. So we see Jesus' beauty, we drink of his beauty, we keep walking in his majesty and his glory and his power, and he fills up our cup and he invites us to deeper and deeper intimacy, and then he just, we get to invite others, it's amazing, he's good, oh, taste and see of him, he's amazing, taste and see of him, he's amazing, he, he, the purpose is that we would walk in dependent intimacy with Christ, that's what you were created for, you weren't created simply to follow rules or some abstract ideas about God, you're created to uh, follow a living person, we, <laughs> the purpose to walk in dependent intimacy with Christ and invite others, then invite others, you can't help it, he's amazing, Maybe the hardest part about a preacher is standing up here and talking about how amazing it is, and then just people are like, meh. It's hard. I have to give that to Jesus. He's experienced it five zillion times more than I have. To walk in dependent intimacy with Christ, 
and then invite others into dependent intimacy. Now, some of you have never grown up with this concept of God as intimate. You've You've grown up with the concept of God as he has some abstract rules. He stays over there. He sent some rules down to earth or maybe a few doctrinal ideas. You have to assent to those. But the whole point of heaven is not to assent to a, a, a series of doctrinal statements. It's to see God. In fact, the Christmas song, Fit Us for Heaven. I don't know if you remember that one. Is that Silent Night? What is that one? Away in a manger, isn't it? Away in a manger. Fit us for heaven. Do you know what you're asking when you sing that? Get me ready right now to experience that intimacy in in small tastes right now so that I'm so hungry for heaven, so hungry to be with you, Father. The point of heaven isn't simply the end of suffering. It's to be face-to-face with our creator in intimacy, which we're created for. And that's what we're made for. And we get to invite others to it. Jesus, that's what he was doing. So what we're inviting people to is not a set of ideas We're not inviting, now to be clear, we want to have the right ideas about God. I'm holding up a Bible for those of you listening on the radio. We want to have accurate ideas about God so that we can show the beauty of a living person. When you have wrong doctrine, it makes Jesus ugly, all right? So we're very, we want to be right doctrinally because we want to accurately paint how beautiful God the Father is in Jesus and the Holy Spirit and their plan in the world, yeah? We're inviting people to a living king. We sang this morning, the king is alive. I want you to experience, I want every person hearing my voice to experience the king is alive. He's amazing. I'm not, when you go share the gospel with someone, you're not asking them to believe a set of ideas or a set of rules. That's how they're hearing you probably. You're saying, no, the king is alive. If Jesus is not alive, we need to close our doors because all I'm giving you is a bunch of abstract ideas. That doesn't change your heart. You want, he's meant to be experienced. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's li- t- tasting and experiencing him. Well, let's keep going here. Verse 11 and 12 together. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He's praying here, Jesus is praying, that they would be kept in God's name. Now, the reason he says that about Judas at the end is Judas didn't fall away because Jesus wasn't quite strong enough to hold on to him. It was because it was meant to be predicted even in Old Testament scriptures that Judas would fall away. He made his own choices, and yet at the same time, God saw it was going to happen. It wasn't because Jesus wasn't powerful enough. That's why he's saying it right here. But he's asking for these others who believe in him, keep them. Keep them in your name. Now again, let's review. What does that mean to be kept in your name? Kept in the glory of who God is. Jesus wants you to regularly regularly experience how glorious he is. He wants you to regularly, regularly experience how amazing he is and how powerful he is, how beautiful he is. Keep them in your name. He's not asking about an abstract. Don't keep them simply in a set of ideas or rules. Keep them in your name. You're alive. You're alive. Now, something that's important here, verse 11, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name. There's something interesting here. I won't spend a lot of time on it. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus has called God Father dozens and dozens of times. And this is the only one where he says, Holy Father. In fact, it's the only time those two words occur together in Scripture. Kind of interesting. But it's worth meditating on. What is his name? Holy Father. Now, his holiness means his power in his absolute majesty, in his moral purity. That's his holiness. You don't come quickly to a holy God. You need someone, you need an advocate to take you to the holy God, Jesus. But at the same time, he's father. Do you see the balance? And throughout history, sometimes we overemphasize his holiness to the exclusion of his fatherness. Sometimes we overemphasize his fatherness to the exclusion of his holiness. He's both, and you can't cut one out. Holy father, I want them to experience your holiness and I want them to experience your fatherhood. Holy Father, keep them in your name. See, Jesus is asking the Father. Jesus is asking the Father to keep his followers intimately connected to the Father, experiencing and living for his 
glory. They're meant to experience that glory, taste and see that the Lord is good, and live for that glory, glory greater than themselves. Think about Abraham. Abraham was meant to, hmm, he says, through you all the nations on the earth will be blessed. That's a greater glory than his own comfort. And he says it to the Israelites. He says, um, when you go to the promised land, it's to make Jesus' name, it's to make the name of Yahweh, his Old Testament name, great right? To carry his beauty to the ends of the earth. And then here he says to his disciples, you're meant to go and be amongst the world and carry his beauty and his glory to the end of the earth. And it's the same in 2021. We're meant to experience God and carry his glory to the ends of the earth. It starts out with your neighbor. It starts out with your spouse. It starts out with your children. In fact, in some ways it's harder to carry God's glory to your spouse than your co-worker sometimes because <laughs> they see your sin. Hmm. But the re- you just say, yeah, I'm a sinner and that's why I need a savior. He loves us. His heart towards us is grace and not clean up your own mess. It's grace. It's glorious. Okay, so review again. You were created to live under Christ's ownership. So what does surrendering to dependent intimacy with Christ lead to? Let's look at that first statement though first. You were created to live under Christ's ownership. Uh, is anyone else's skin crawling with that statement? Probably. If it doesn't, it will by Thursday, Okay. All right, I'm created to live under Christ's ownership? Oh, oh. Well, I want to remind you, what does surrendering to dependent intimacy with Christ lead to? He tells us in verse 13. Look at verse 13. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world. Why? That they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Okay, Jesus is saying that surrendering to his ownership leads to joy, and the word fulfilled means filled up to the top, overflowing, nearly burst the container. That's what he's saying when we surrender to his ownership. Fulfilled is overflowing, full to bursting joy. That's what he's saying. In fact, he said this multiple times. This word has occurred multiple times in John. The joy of following Jesus, it leads to this bursting, overflowing joy. Now, some of you are in the suffering season, okay? Some of you are in the suffering season. And that's why Jesus says, my joy. Let me tell you about Jesus' joy, okay? For three years, Jesus woke up every morning knowing that there were people trying to kill him. And he still had joy because he spent time with the Father. I'm not saying it's easy. But he had joy. If he said, my joy, the disciples were like, yeah, Jesus, we've been with you three years and that's not all that impressive. But they'd spent three years with him and they'd seen his beauty and his joy. So for three years, people had been trying to kill him. For three years, his mom didn't really understand who he was. His brothers and sisters certainly didn't understand who he was. His closest friends, Peter and the other disciples, they don't really fully get it. And yet he's still filled with joy because he's just rejoicing in the Father. Now, Jesus, in fact, you could argue that Jesus felt joy and sadness more deeply than any of us have ever felt because his heart was open. I love that. So he was a man of sorrows as well, but even in that sorrow, his joy was not based upon a healthy retirement and someone loving him or numbing out the pain. It was based on his relationship with the Father. He wants us to have that. Jesus had overflowing, full to bursting joy. If he didn't, the prostitutes wouldn't have been attracted to him and the tax collectors would not have liked him very much. Who wants to be with a sourpuss? Yeah, he's beautiful. He's joyful. So this is us. This is us, all of us. God's speaking to you. He says, I want you to show you my glory. Will you trust me? I want to show you my glory. Now, I have the picture here of Abraham seeing the stars. And this is all of us. You say, well, Tice, that's not true. That's back when, that's the varsity. Remember, I'm not varsity, Tice. And not only that, that's back in the Bible. Well, okay, Paul says that when you trust in Jesus, you are now a child of Abraham. In other words, you are called to experience God and to believe in God and to move out in faith just like Abraham. Abraham, but there's so much unbelief in our hearts. We have to keep coming back to him to show, to see his glory over and over again. And that happens from listening to Jesus through his word and listening to Jesus through his people. Listen to Jesus through his word. That's how we experience his glory. 
My greatest problem is my unbelief leads me to sin because I don't think Jesus is all that beautiful and all that glorious, so I have to come to him again and again and again. And he keeps, he's so gracious. He keeps showing me his beauty and his forgiveness and his grace and his majesty over and over again through his word. Listen to Jesus through his word. God gave us this amazing gift in the last year and a half of teaching men and women how to study the word, the every man a warrior and the different women's studies, how to spend time and listen to Jesus in his word. It's awesome. And he shows you his glory over and over and over again. And we need it over and over and over again. And it's not going to run out. He says, rivers, plural of living water. Okay? So it's not, well, he showed me his beauty that one time five years ago, but he's only got this much grace and he's going to run out. So I better be careful and ration it. No, no, nope. Keep listening to Jesus through his word. Keep listening to Jesus through his people. He speaks through his people. We have to share our hearts with us. I'm trust, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to trust God today. You need to have someone in your heart, in your life, who you share that with. I'm struggling to trust God today. That really hurt. That person hurt me. And they're going to they're gonna pull you back. They're going to give you God's word and remind you that he's worth following. He's beautiful. He's forgiving because he can forgive you. You can forgive them. And notice the pattern. God reveals himself and invites us to trust and follow him. So we come to him over and over again. And then we re-surrender. We live by faith. The Bible says that those who are following Jesus live by faith. Faith isn't just something we do when we became a Christian back at eight years old. We have to keep surrendering, keep giving him our life over and over and over again. Tice, I struggle with faith. Me too. Let me give you a really helpful Bible verse. It's Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. It says, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. Your pastor has a faith problem, which is why he has to be in the word all the time, (laughs) regularly. And that's not just meant for the varsity. All of it, there is no varsity, by the way, to be really clear. Good grief, kill it. All right? That's meant for all of us. All of us are needy and lack faith. Faith comes from hearing, hearing from the word of Christ, from his word. We re-surrender. And then we rejoice in God's ownership. We rejoice in his purposes for us. He's smarter than you. He's smarter than me. So you can trust his ownership and you can follow his purposes. Let's pray. Lord, hmm, my American unbelief rears its ugly head time and again. I think freedom is only having to follow you when I agree with you. And I I beg you to continue to open my eyes to your glory. And I beg you to open us as a people. We help us to be a people who observes your beauty and your glory over and over and over again and surrenders over and over and over again so that you get so much credit and glory in central Nebraska and around the world. Give us faith by staying connected to you and your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you know Christ as your Savior, really know him, not just with head knowledge, but with your heart, you've given